thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Stefano, uh, for inviting me here. Uh, thank you to the audience for being here. Um, one word before starting, um, my English is that of one who knows the language but has never lived in an English-speaking country for more than two weeks. <laughs> so uh, consider this and uh, if you think that something is not clear enough, feel free to ask me to rephrase it or say it, say it in another way. I will not take it personally. I will not think you are being impolite. And um, since this is a seminar, I would also like to ask you to oh, feel free to make questions even during the talk, all right? It's, uh, it will be part of the uh, game that we'll be playing here. Um, I want to talk to you today uh, about the social diffusion of sophisticated ideas, what I mean by that. Um, we can start thinking about a series of words that immediately look very complex, very sophisticated, such as uh, batrachian echinoid, mechanism design, uh, explicature, quantum decoherence, etc. You have them all there. Oh, what is special about these words? You come, I know you come from different backgrounds, so maybe some of you have recognized some of these words, but not the others. Well, that is because uh, the characteristic of these words is that they form a conceptual representation in our mind whose semantic content is very specific and is only available <coughs> to a restricted community, a specialized community, a community of scholars, for example. Uh, so these representations have the property of belonging to a disciplinary jargon and of having no ambiguities, all right? When you say quaver to a musician, he, he exactly know what it is. When you say mechanism design to an economist, he, exact, he or she knows exactly what, what is meant by that. But the public at large may not. Here is, uh, jargon, is that French for the language used by criminals among themselves? Uh, in French? Um, I, I'm not sure. Maybe I thought. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> this, this this implies that scholars can be uh, or mafia. <laughs> or mafia. <laughs> now consider these these other words: inflation, globalization global warming, democracy, welfare, homosexuality, business cycle. These seem pretty easy to understand, right? Uh, they are words that we use every day, that we read in newspapers. Uh, however, these words create conceptual, a conceptual representation in our mind whose semantic content is unspecific because we can use these words in very different contexts and in very different ways. It is available to a wide community because these words reach the newspapers. They don't stay in uh, scholarly journals, for example. And we may therefore call the representations of, uh, um, uh, um, created by these words complex representations. All right? Complex representations belong to common parlance and have ambiguities. Uh, these words can be used, as I said, in different ways uh, and have a vast semantic, they cover a vast semantic area. We're going to talk about complex representations. We're going to talk about, these, about how these kinds of words spread in society and how this affects the forming and the spread of ideas in our mind, okay? And the relationship that these, the link that these uh, words uh, um, have, make between uh, the scholarly community that uses them, the specialist knowledge that is embedded in them, and the common way of understanding them. Uh, we will see what, this, what, I, what are the results of this matching. Uh, 
So as a definition of complex representations, we can say that they are conceptual representations. OK, this is, I think, fairly clear which are clear enough to circulate widely within a population and thus become cultural, part of cultural discourse, one might say, but have contents and implications that cannot be appreciated without resorting to expert knowledge. So graphically, this could be put like so. A complex representation can have several meanings. Three is just an example can have several meanings. Uh, some of them are publicly discussed, reach the great, the, 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 the great public, the public at large. But then there are also other meanings that are only known to experts and may be vital in understanding arguments that involve such words, that involve such complex representations. For example, the business cycle. Business cycle seems something easy to understand. Seems to be something easy to understand. We all know what business means. We all know what cycle means, right? Up and down, a wave. Business cycle is what we experience in, uh, in the space of more or less a decade in Western economies. The economy goes up, and then goes down, then goes up again, then goes down. It's easy. So what we know about business cycle is uh, that the economy, it's, uh, it, what, what the, the concept of business cycle brings in our, to our mind is that we may experience economic crunches, job losses, okay, it's something that we can touch, uh, that the economy is uh, in the hand of investors who happen to be very often or to be described as greedy and irrational and or irrational. This is something that we find in newspapers, for example, in political talk. But then monetary policy. I've put monetary policy there. What is monetary policy exactly? Well, we all know that central banks issue money. But how does that exactly work? Well, if, there is, if there are economists among you, they might have the answer. But I'm not sure that the men in the street, the men of the street, would know exactly how monetary policy works. Is monetary policy relevant to the business cycle? Does it play a vital role in understanding what the business cycle is? Well, as it turns out, the most important book on the American Great Depression of the 30s claims that the Federal Reserve is to be blamed for having contracted the money supply too rapidly after the 1929 Wall Street crash, turning what would have been a recession into the Great Depression. So in the, business, in the concept of business cycle, monetary policy is a central notion. But it's a very complicated notion. It is something that is perhaps more closely related to the first class of words that we have read rather than to the second. By the way, this is Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, uh, A Monetary History of the United States. It is now uh, acknowledged as a, one of the great classics in economic theory uh, of the 20th century. Credit default swap. Now, as a European, I'm particularly sensitive to this. Um, um, there has been uh, a lot of uh, talk about uh, the Greek bonds, for example. Investors were not <coughs> trusting Greek <coughs> bonds anymore, Greek government bonds anymore. Credit default swap bring to our mind risk-taking. Our economic system is risky. It's based on taking risks. And that means that it, can always, it cannot always work. Speculation, another catchwork that comes up in public discussions. But then, a form of insurance. Huh? What? A credit default swap? A form of insurance? Is it a form of insurance against what? How, how, how does it really work? This is more complicated. Out of, I, I didn't do a systematic, um, uh, a systematic 
uh, analysis of all the articles that have come out since uh, uh, the, the, the beginning of uh, the Greek uh, crisis. But um, more or less one can say uh, intuitively that out of 10 articles, that uh, 10 uh, uh, newspaper articles um, uh, or press releases, that uh, po political press releases that talk, ab talk of speculation, there are, mo there are maybe one or two who take into account the fact that credit default swaps are actually a signal of what's going on. They're not the cause of what is going on with the Greek bonds. Um, there was a good uh, uh, metaphor that um, an economist uh, made on an Italian newspaper. He said, when you have fever, you cannot blame the thermometer. And the credit default swap, the price of the credit default swaps is actually the thermometer. It's not the germ. Well, if you're just risk taking is seen as a bad thing in a sense and speculation, whereas insurance is a good thing. Exactly. And so from the inside, it looks like a sensible thing to do. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this is a, I have a couple of slides about what I just said. This is a statement by Greek Prime Minister Papandreou. Uh, um, dates back to March 2010. Time to end opportunistic speculation against us. Hmm? And what, what words would... Uh, mm, I think this is, not, this is not how it is supposed to be projected, actually. I'm sorry for that. Uh, there should be other text showing, showing uh, up around. But anyway, uh, this is taken from, um, from a newspaper article uh, which talks about uh, bearish wagers people who wage, so it gives the idea of gambling. And here I have another slide that shows again with the same, with the same technical problem, but you have, uh, three, uh, you have 11 occurrences in this article, in this newspaper article of the word bet. Hmm? So it always gives the idea of something, fin finance is all about risk taking, betting, it's, uh, it's irrational, We're, we are in the hands of people who play with our lives. Well, they're playing with metaphors. They're actually playing with metaphors because here we have the title of a Wall Street Journal article that says investors playing defense Heightened Greek debt woes. They are defending themselves. Actually, what? Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Th once again, oh, yeah, right. but in this case, it somehow brings in the idea of insurance. The idea that the credit default swap, which was blamed, that it, it was a, it was a financial instrument that was blamed, and uh, some people in Europe, I mean, president, French President uh, Sarkozy, wanted to make it legal. Um, but it's actually the thermometer. It is actually something that signals through its price fluctuations. It signals that there is something that, that is going wrong with uh, a certain government's bond emissions. So why complex representations such as credit default swap, such as business cycle, are important for understanding how ideas spread because they're relevant to topical events. Complex representations are representations that contain very sophisticated ideas in sight but are topical to, are uh, uh, relevant to topical events. That is not the same as, I don't know, uh, string theory in physics. You know, it doesn't af really affect our life. <laughs> um, Gravity does, <laughs> but uh, um, they're easily understood. People read a newspaper article about the Greek, uh, the Greek crisis, and you you come out of it as you know you you get some idea of what is going on. You can have an opinion of what is going on, and therefore they are highly debated by the public. So. In order to better delve into the topic, I would, I would like now to introduce you to a case study, okay? Uh, which is the case study that served me to uh, come up with this uh, 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 with this idea, with this finding, I would say, uh, the importance of complex representations in understanding how ideas spread. Um, 
So it was very empirical. I, s I, I, I began by analyzing details, hmm? looking at things and analyzing the, deta the details. And the, 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 the things I looked at were pamphlets and comedies issued in England at the time of a very important economic change. That is between the end of the 16th century and the beginning of the 17th century, the so-called Elizabethan and Jacobean period, very known in uh, uh, the English culture because it's the period of William Shakespeare, okay? a period of great flourishing in the arts and, uh, 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 and in literature. And in science, too. That is the period of Francis Bacon, huh? the beginning of the very beginnings of the scientific method. What happened with m money? Why money? Huh? Why these Elizabethan coins there? Uh, okay, some, uh, some setting. This is where these, those plays were uh, performed in England at that time. Uh, this is a reconstruction of uh, uh, Shakespeare's Globe in London. Uh, consider that starting from 1576 and by the end of the century, there were in London 26 playhouses. So considering the population of London at that time, which was not the population London has today, it was a city of about 200,000, uh, 200, 250,000, then it grew um, to 400,000. It's quite massive. Rome today doesn't have 26 playhouses of this size, capable of uh, hosting more than a hundred people. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a topic for another conference. Um, these playhouses, consider that these playhouses were very different from uh, the theaters we go to today. They were not meant to be accessed and then the lights dim, you sit down, you stay silent, and you watch the film or the theater show, and you go out. There were, they were places of gathering. People would go there and also talk. Talk about what, uh, 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 the, uh, talk about the play, talk about what was uh, uh, significant and salient uh, uh, in those times. And obviously, the play would address these topics. And what happens in Elizabethan and Jacobean England is that plays start talking about economic topics. Now, money has always been an issue in culture. It has been since the, 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 the Greeks uh, to our present day. But in London at that time, there is a genre transformation of comedy into what is today called uh, Jacobean city comedy and money plays. The, top, the economic topics become so important in the play that they required a renaming of a genre. So they are very much, it was very popular, there are very many in the literature of the time. A uh, couple of um, quotations from uh, secondary literature to have a grasp of what I'm talking of this importance of money at that time um, in in uh, in um, culture in in pamphlets in uh, books in in drama in comedies. Economy begins to penetrate all the human relations. Money becomes the only way of assessing value, profit, the only impetus for all human action. That was unprecedented, unprecedented. Clearly, there was something happening at the time that led writers, intellectuals, poets, playwrights to tackle this topic. Uh, of course, as this other critique with a rather unpronounceable name says, um, of course, love and money have always been the staple of economic drama, but in these plays, money is not simply the reward the hero gets at the end along with the girl. It is a much more fluid and indeterminate quantity, as potentially powerful and often as delusory as the philosopher's stone. 
So money is not only very present in the literature of the time, but it's also depicted in a rather peculiar way. Here is a quotation in, in English that, I don't know, at least to me, maybe because I'm a uh, I'm foreigner, at least to me it sounds pretty funny. Uh, I would not dare to read it. <laughs> you can <laughs> read it by yourself. It's uh, from uh, William Rowley, a uh, playwright of the time and also a pamphleteer, um, A Search for Money. That was presented by, an edit by, by, uh, by the editor at the time like this. This tract is extremely rare, has been well and carefully edited, etc. This, this, uh, this is taken from the uh, 19th century edition. Um, and the fact that it's extremely rare, well, that may be a 19th century uh, judgment. Actually, the tract was pretty popular at the time. People would read it. There were many copies. Here is a more familiar guy, Ben Johnson, um, Volponi. This is the beginning of the play. Volponi is all about an old uh, tingy, I think the word is tingy Venetian, stingy Venetian. Avaro. Who, who, uh, huh? Avaro. Avaro. Huh? <laughs> um, uh, surrounded by a group of uh, friends or would-be friends or, or wannabe friends. Uh, who are only interested in uh, having his money in heritage. And the play begins with these words, good morning to the day, oh, I cannot read it here, uh, and next my gold, open the shrine that I may see my saint, and uh, Mosca the servant opens the shrine, hail the world's soul and mine, more glad than is the teeming earth to see the longed uh, for sun, peep through the honors of celestial ram, am I to view my spl thy splendor, darkening his, <laughs> I cannot see it from this angle. So it is a sort of prayer to gold, okay? It's a sort of prayer to gold. Why does Volpone pray his gold? Because that is his actual power. Uh, we would expect that Volpone is the character that the author is making, is trying to make fun of. This is not the case. Ben Johnson will be making fun of the other characters. Volpone will be somehow, somewhat respected for his cunning, for his intelligence, for his subtlety. The old fox. Uh? Yeah. Volpone, the fox. Mm -hmm. Yes, Volpone. Oh, yes, yes. By the way, Volpone is uh, Volpe in Italian means uh, fox means fox, yeah. So it's Volpone in Italian sounds like the big fox. Which is how it is, chicken's name. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 this is wolf. This is wolf. wolf. It's wolf. a little different. Mm. Oh, is it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sheep's clothing. <laughs> um, but subtle, really. Okay. So actually here, um, Volpone is depicted as, uh, you know, being uh, aware of the power that he has in his hands. And this power comes from this magic thing that is money as understood by Ben Johnson. We could not miss him. William Shakespeare with Thomas Middleton as uh, recent scholarship has taught us. Timon of Athens. By the way, these, uh, these lines were also quoted by uh, Marx in, uh, in the Capital, uh, because Marx too had the idea of uh, money as something a bit tricky and magic. Gold, yellow, glittering, precious gold, thus much of this will make black, white, foul, fair, wrong, right, base, noble, old, young, coward, violent. Uh, money is a alchemic, uh, an alchemic element. It's something that changes things. Hmm? What were they trying to say? What was the experience they had of the world that led them to uh, recur to a long-standing tradition of contempt of money and change that uh, and add to that tradition the idea that money was 
some sort of agent, some sort of supernatural tool. Okay, to sum up, in most cases, authors connected the changing economy with human vices, suggesting that the new economic order rewarded immoral behavior. I already said that that was a time of economic change uh, of, on, a, on a very large scale. Uh, feudal economy was transforming into a uh, market economy. Not so much as we know the market today, but those were the first steps that would lead to the market economy as we know it today. But the idea they had was that this new economy rewarded immoral behavior. Does that ring a bell? <laughs> thinking of speculators, <laughs> thinking of credit default swaps. Being confronted, being confronted with the increasing institutionalization of the new economic order, playwrights and pamphleteers began reflecting on the driving force behind its ongoing diffusion. At this point, we know that their simple answer was blame it on the money. Why money worked for this, uh, for this argument? Uh, because money is a complex representation, precisely because of that. Why? Well, because by definition we know that complex representations require expert knowledge to be used, uh, to be understood properly, right? However, full, uh, few objects are more familiar than money across nearly all cultures, and yet, money is also an economic notion and one characterized by rather counterintuitive properties. Now, I cannot uh, delve too much into that, but consider only that economic text textbooks, on average, devote more than a chapter only to talk about money and its role in an economy and uh, its various uh, um, um, shapes. Money as the things that we hold in our hand, but money as loaned money, money as promised money, all these uh, financial instruments that are also part of the uh, monetary base of an economy. So it's a very complex thing, actually, and very much debated in economics. So the notion of money, the economic notion of money, is a complex representation. So it is something that is available, that everybody can understand, but at the same time it has some this sort of shaded area that, as we're going to see, helps its diffusion, um, induce people to talk about it. In a moment we will see why. Hmm? This has to do with cognition. For now let's just think that money is a complex representation in that it is something that is very familiar but still conceals some complicated properties aspects that only experts know. So what made money relevant? First of all, as I said, money contempt has a long-standing tradition. Okay? Those writers were humanistically trained, they knew the classics, you find money contempt in Aristotle, you find money contempt in Latin authors, you find it through the medieval age. Mm -hmm. You find money contempt in the Bible and the New Testament. Christ in the temple, for example. So there is a tradition for that. But that's not enough. There must be something that makes the tradition relevant to the here and now. What makes it relevant to the here and now is two sets of factors which we may call environmental and cognitive. Okay? And the environmental factors may be divided in two subsets, historical and epistemic. Okay, I'm going to, the, 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 I hope this will be uh, clear in a, in a few seconds. Environmental factors. Okay, we are situated always in a here and now. We see things. And the things we see make us think of other things. 
they trigger our memory. I propose you to watch one minute of a clip from uh, a TV show that's called The Wire, second season. This is the beginning of the first uh, 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 of the first episode of the second season. We will see two policemen um, navigating in, uh, 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 on the coast in the coast of uh, Baltimore and just talking. Okay, there's no real action going on here. The plot has not started yet. It's just them talking. Two people doing their job and talking in a in a moment of relax. Let's see what they say. Um, I would like you to pay particular attention to the last few seconds of the video. Oops, sorry. Um. Okay, so they're, they're, they're navigating, they're, they're going to, uh, they, they receive the call, they're going to do their job, and then suddenly they see something, see something that is in the environment, okay? And that triggers a memory. It is a memory that is relevant to economics. They're talking about their fathers being laid off. They're talking about the 70s, a period of economic crisis. This is an example of the environment triggering memories that may require some further information at, at some point if you want to delve further into them, okay? Let's imagine what, how the conversation might continue. Um, yeah, my father was laid, out in, uh, laid off in, in uh, 78, my, my dad 73. Oh, what a bad period that was. What was it? Uh, how, how do they call it? We, they, they were high prices, but then people were losing jobs. They call it stagflation of something. Mm -hmm. mm? Stagflation. We will return to this. Mm? But this is just an example of how the environment can trigger um, uh, memories, work with our cognition. Let's turn back to our uh, English writers who were faced with a certain number of historical facts and events that called for attention, called catch their attention, that were particularly salient. Yes, yeah. beg your pardon? Absolutely. Yes. Th that is that is a perfect parallel. Absolutely, and in fact, uh, the nineteenth century uh, is uh, the second uh, uh, best uh, period uh, to study to study these kind of issues in in the literature. Uh, the nineteenth century in British literature, of course, but also in French literature. Exactly, and I there's the same logic going on. You see things you deem them relevant, you start thinking about them, you look for uh, knowledge, episteme, to try to make sense of them. But let's, do, let's go what's one, step of, one step at a time. So, what were these uh, people confronted with? Demographic growth. Demographic growth has huge economic and social consequences, but also need an, a statistical institution to be plotted, and there was no such thing. They had demographic growth. We know this because present-time scholars have 
gone to the parishes and have checked who was born and when. Uh, but there was no statistic, there was no statistics at the time. So it was just something that affected prices, but they didn't know what was affecting prices. What would you think if you see that prices ro rise and you don't know why they are rising? You would think that uh, the, the, the shopper is not, uh, is not fair. You would think that someone is cheating you. You would think that there's greed around. The great inflation. This was called uh, so not by contemporaries, but by a 19th century scholar um, who used the term reflect out of, out of the way contemporaries talked about the inflation. They were very afraid. It was actually a very small inflation compared by our standards. It was something like a 1% inflation in food products. But, uh, but, uh, but it was still very scary. Why, why were prices changed? What was going on? Enclosure of common fields. Londoners would see all these uh, peasants coming to the city because these peasants had no field to uh, uh, cultivate anymore. Starting from this, uh, this had started actually some decades before the Elizabethan time. Sorry, the Elizabethan time under Henry VIII, but the consequences protracted also in the Elizabethan and Jacobean times. Uh, regulation of usury, this was a shock because usury was the devil's business, mm -hmm. right? Was the devil's business. But it was so diffused and there was some starting knowledge that perhaps lending money could help investment and could help realizing uh, businesses, actualizing businesses that otherwise would not have resources uh, uh, enough to exist. And in 1571, it's very nice to read the parliamentary documents of that, uh, of that uh, related to that act, because you see how uh, uh, the, the, the members of the parliament shifted from, you know, some, some traditional or ideologic view, then some more, uh, one, some more practical views, you know, like we, we could never stop it anyway. This was one of the things that they would say. In 1571, the British Parliament regulates loans. They establish that loans cannot, that interest cannot be higher than 8%. But by doing so, they legalized an activity that was traditionally viewed as hideous. So it was a cultural shock. And probably the most important thing, emergence of social mobility and harshening of social competition. Uh, the gentry was losing their lands. Yeoman, little estate owners were becoming more powerful. Moneylenders were becoming more powerful. Uh, shareholders of merchant companies were becoming powerful. The court would address these people when they need financial aid and no longer the big estate hold, hold, uh, owners. Social mobility, social competition, things that scare, things that catch attention, and things with which a complex representation such as money and other economic concepts, because there was also talk of trade, talk of money lending, of course, could connect and yield significant inferences. Like, ah, it's about the money. I read in the Bible that money is bad and people are getting greedy because they understand that money can give power. I understand, I see now what is going on. Hmm? And there's more to that. Epistemic factors. You know, uh, these people would resort, whether explicitly or not, to three kinds of arguments. Traditional doctrines about social structure and professional callings. Back then, you were not supposed to go to school and find your talents, develop them, and then uh, flourish uh, through the use of them. You were supposed to do what your father had done before and your grandfather had done before. Uh, classical and biblical theories of money, money lending, and land renting. 
you should not use your land for money, to make money. The land is your identity. Mm? Mm -hmm. Aristocrats in, uh, in, in England had their name after their land. Uh, if you read Shakespeare's play, Shakespeare's tragedies uh, set in England, uh, for example, King Lear, you see that characters are named with the name of places, Gloucester, Kent. These are characters in, in King Lear, but they're also, as we all know, names of places. Concepts and recurring topics borrowed from contemporary economic debates. Okay, I will not go mm, too much into that. It has to do with mercantilism. So, what did they have at their disposal, at their uh, disposition? The crisis of the body politic metaphor for society. This was something that humanists had in their head. The, bo the body politic metaphor meant society is like a body, a human body, and every, just as every part of the human body has to uh, uh, serve a certain function, every individual in a society has to serve a certain function for society. And you cannot ask an eye to uh, hear or an ear to see. But then people would uh, uh, sell their lands and uh, invest in a trade, in, a foreign, tra in foreign trade, bring sp spices from the East to England, changing of identity. That was unconceivable. And that was very relevant to the, to the uh, historical factors that we saw before. Harshening on social competition? Why? Because people are not respecting the body politic anymore. The traditional aversion for money and most activities related to it, I've already, I've already mentioned that. The mercantilist debate, that was the, s the expert part. Okay? There, was, uh, there were, um, in those periods in England, uh, were published the first tracts about, uh, about economics, but it was pretty restricted circle and only some, only very few aspects came out of that circle and became a topic for, uh, 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 for comedies. Guess what? Mercantilists were obsessed with money. They confused it with capital. They thought that the state should accumulate bullion. And they thought that foreign trade was a zero-sum game. So it meant that you always had to have your balance of trade positive, because otherwise it meant that you were not well off. In the negative, the ignorance of some fundamental concepts of economic knowledge. OK, well, that is uh, central to what we're talking about, right? Each of the first three factors bear a relation of relevance with at least one of the historical factors listed above. For example, social mobility and the crisis of the idea of society as a body politic. Uh, each of them called attention to money and economic affairs one re once related to the economic factors to which they were relevant. The idea is, how do I interpret what, what I see here around me? What is going on? what my neighbor is telling me about his life, what is happening to my life, what I see in the streets. I have some, epist uh, some, some knowledge that is available to me, right? Uh, and I can choose what is, per what is more relevant within that m body of knowledge to what I'm seeing. And I make the connections. That is called relevance theory. and leads to a situation of this kind. Mm. Uh, suppose Bob could be one of the two policemen, policemen um, start talking about the crisis of the 70s, right? And says uh, a stagflation was the major problem. Or read in, a, in an old newspaper or in a book that uh, the 70s had 
stagflation, experienced stagflation, what is it? It cannot be the proposition expressed by the journalist or the writer, since Bob is not capable of building the corresponding mental representation. Bob doesn't know what stagflation is. It is not just the utterance, because Bob is capable of stating his belief by paraphrasing this utterance rather than merely quoting it. Yes, the 70s were a hard time. My father was laid off. Moreover, Bob believes many of its implications, except for example, that Western economies ha uh, had uh, an important problem. There is, however, one expression that Bob cannot paraphrase and the implications of which he cannot compute, namely stagflation. What Bob believes, then, seems to be a representation which combines several concepts with one unanalyzed or incompletely analyzed term. Yes? So, in essence, partial public knowledge of uh, subjects that are socially relevant uh, is dangerous because it can cause people on a mass scale to label a symptom, uh, a, a thermometer, as a cause which can further aggravate a bad situation. Um, in some cases, yes, but it's one of these dangerous things that I think are unavoidable. So it is better. It is better to. It is better. It is better to be aware. Uh, you invest in education. It, it's better to be aware that this happens, and um, perhaps to diffuse this knowledge. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I think I know where you want to. When it went, where this is leading, but uh, I I don't have a solution to the problem I am uh, I am I am trying to um, display to explain. I just want to show the the facts, and then you know this is an ongoing project. Yes. But my basic question was, uh, do you still believe that it's better to have uh, this partial knowledge than uh, to have no knowledge at all, even though uh, the public will not be able to gain specialist knowledge in all of these Yes, yeah, of course. Absolutely, yes. I do believe it is better. This is a, this is a, um, a, um, the, the less, the less, uh, the lesser evil, e what? The lesser yes, evil, the yeah? Effect. Lesser yeah. evil. Even the supposed specialists in the serious situation did not have the knowledge they needed. Oh, in certain right. cases, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't, it be, so wouldn't it be better about the common people? I mean, these are the people who ruin the economy, and the main cause of it, of course, was greed and fraud. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is well established. But they got a free pass. In our recent crisis, they were not hauled up, that, uh, even though it was completely established. The person making $50,000 was given a $1 million home mm -hmm. by mm. a fraud, by, by, by filling up things that they were not capable of reading or understanding. Yeah. And then when they are... Um, yeah, it is also true, though, that uh, financial institutions such as Freddie, um, uh, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac <laughs> were backed by the Federal Reserve. There was, a, there was a political commitment to, uh, you know, populistic commitment to give as, as many house uh, lodging as possible yeah. for electoral reasons. Mm -hmm. But to go back to the question... And uh, then that the gentleman... That, that she raised... That it would seem that even a partial apprehension of what's going on um, opens a conversation that can allow in more of this expert knowledge mm -hmm. and directs attention of the, the distressed people away from witches and devils and mm -hmm. tapeworms and all the rest of the <laughs> <laughs> stuff. That if you read, you know, these medieval tracts against usury, for example, mm -hmm. it's heroic. I mean, um, well, uh, the gentleman? Uh, yes. I was wondering, uh, to what extent do you think this might be, ex this sort of phenomenon might be explained by um, Dennis' belief and belief concept, sort of the idea that uh, one ought to uh, believe a certain poorly understood proposition, a sort of a, 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 a allegiance to a group or something? Yes. Uh, Dennis insists on mm, basically on trust. His, his stance is, uh, is, 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 um, is trust. I think there is another explanation. That is what, what I'm going, what I would like to present now. Because this is not the end of the story. This is a limited comprehension. What, I'm going, what I would like to introduce, you now, introduce now, it's a different concept, that of lay comprehension, which is an understanding that is not simply based on trust. It is an understanding that is partial and unaware of being partial. 
So this is the next step we're doing. Okay, ready? <laughs> um, what makes the news relevant to Bob? Because hmm? we're talking about relevance, relevance, relevance is a bit, a bit a catch word here. It is actually a concept, an established concept in uh, linguistics and cognitive sciences. It was uh, first uh, uh, presented by, uh, in an interdisciplinary work actually, by a linguist and an anthropologist. Dan Sperber was the is the anthropologist, and Deirdre Wilson, a linguist. Uh, one is uh, based in Paris, the other in London. Um, a book was first published 25 years ago and then republished 15 years ago. Uh, and they're, they're working on a third edition. Um, at any given time, humans perceive more phenomena than they are able to pay attention to and they have more information stored in memory than they can exploit. Right? Um, cognitive efficiency involves making the right choices in selecting which available new information to attend to and which available past information to process it with. The right choice is in this respect consists in bringing together input and memory information, the joint processing of which will provide as much cognitive effect as possible for as little mental effort as possible. Cognitive effect means having the sensation that I, f that I know something, having the sensation that I somehow uh, master my environment, all right? Um, What is the implication of this? That when we are put in front of a novel cognitive task, we are asked to do something, to think about something, we can have several different attitudes. One attitude can be, you know that you know. Okay? You see a number 5 here, you see a plus here, you see a 7 here, you see a sign of equal. You know what that is, all right? You know that you know. It's a simple addition, you do it, you're fine. You know that you don't know and that it is difficult to know. This is why we go to doctors, mm -hmm. all right? We have some pain somewhere in our, our body, we go to the doctor because we know that we don't know and it's very difficult. You need a degree to know that. Huh? It's the simple representations, the, the difficult words, very specific. You know that you don't know, but you can foresee a viable workaround. This is when we have problems with our computers, for example. That is a cognitive task that we all perform almost every day. You know that, you know, no, I mean, you're not, unless there are even computers, uh, computer engineers here in the audience uh, the, who is not a computer engineer know all too well that you, you don't really know what is happening. But if you restart the computer, maybe that will help. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what you're faced with in, in this, situ th this situation. But here comes the tricky part. You know, you don't know that you don't know, but you think that you know, all right? And this happens with what I named, termed complex representations. They hide their complexity from us. So they put us in this situation, we don't know that we don't know, but we think that we know. We don't know that we don't know everything about credit default swaps. But we think we know and we talk about it. We don't know that we don't know anything about everything about money. But, you know, we have it in our pocket. It's the most simple thing in the world. So we talk about it. Uh, well, there is a huge literature on this, of course. There is a huge literature on everything, but <laughs> and this is no exception. A number of experiments have shown that under certain circumstances, people are easily misled about the nature of a problem they are asked to solve or about the requirements that must be fulfilled in order to attain its solution. They think they have understood the problem they are facing, but in fact they have not. Um, 
this is uh, well known in, in psychology. There are a lot of little games, uh, some of which involve uh, no high, high mathematical knowledge, and they seem very easily solved. Think, for example, of the um, heuristics and biases tradition of uh, uh, Kahneman and, uh, and Tversky. I don't know I, if I'm pronouncing these names well. Um, Kahneman and Tversky showed that uh, when put exactly what, I, wh what is written here, that there are certain tasks that, that people seem to know how to solve, but in fact they're acting irrationally. All right? And they call these use of heuristics and uh, biases in uh, uh, the, uh, finding the solution of the problem. I have a little game here, which uh, also um, fits the picture. Um, what cards would you uh, necessarily turn in order to verify that the statement written below is true? If there is a vowel on one side of the card, then there is an odd number on the other side. Yes. Number three. Number three? Only number three? And number one. And? One and three. One and three. Other other suggestions? Number four. I would say number one because it doesn't predicate anything about anything else. So if, if number if, if the first one has has uh, an odd number on the other side, then you can assess whether it's true. Another suggestion? Well, if the third one has a vowel on the other side, then it's wrong. Yeah, that's called modus tollens. Two gentlemen here. Uh, 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 have showed familiarity with modus tollens. Actually, um, well, first of all, this uh, live experiment shows that there is a, there isn't a debate. Um, uh, but apparently, those who have run this experiment have come out with statistics that show that most people would suggest number one and number four because they are uh, tricked by the idea that this is an odd number, and so if they turn the card. But it's actually number one and number three because you have to verify that E has indeed uh, uh, um, um, an has indeed an odd number on the other side, and that this doesn't. Excuse me. Yes. But that's not what it says. It doesn't say that if there's an even number, that there is a, there is not a vowel on the other side. It doesn't say anything about that. But this is a, this is an interpretation. It's an if P then Q. Uh, it's, it's also okay. So if yeah. All right. Yeah. <coughs> However, there are certain circumstances in which this doesn't create so much problems. Now suppose these are people and not cards, and you have to verify that if they're having if one is having alcohol, then he or she is above eighteen. Huh? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But <laughs> you want to, you want to verify that they are all follow abiding by the rule. You want to verify that they are all abiding by the rule. <laughs> so, uh, well, people end up uh, end up suggesting the right uh, the right answer immediately without even thinking. They they check who's drinking beer and they check who's underage. And then, then that is it, right? Um, there are a number of interpretations. Some say that this is because we are somehow geared to social life, and uh, so the same, the same uh, uh, mental procedure appears more easily done when, when, in a, when, in a social, when applied to a social context. Yes? Isn't it possible that the distinction between legality and illegality and thus the existence of a penalty makes the relevance much more obvious? Uh, that, that is actually that is actually one one interpretation of uh, of the experiment that goes against the um, evolutionary psychology interpretation of it. Yes, that is absolutely one interpretation. It's very hard to say though uh, what what is the the, the right one because this is fairly fairly new after all. This has been going on for some. Uh, so you can marry. All right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. 
you cannot. So this was just to show. Yeah, it was a very little example. I'm 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 uh, close to finishing. Um, it's a very little example of how it is easy to make mistakes. Of how it is easy to find ourselves in the position that I described above um, before. You don't know that you don't know, but you think that you know, right? It's the normal situation. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is very frequent indeed, yeah. When faced with complex representations, people who lack relevant background knowledge are likely to assume attitude for, as a result of the environmental circumstances that make such representations significant to them. All right? Because they make, they make the situation seem linear to us. This means that a complex representation will be considered by the layperson only in so far as it sheds light upon the context to which it connects, because that is what makes the representation relevant to them. This is conjectural. Um, I have no laboratories, I'm not in psychology, I'm a historian, so I'm giving this to the public uh, to, to, uh, and to the scholarly audience. Uh, to, uh, to for, for further developments, but this is my, my conjecture. We'll map it to the Tea Party in America. Uh, that is a... <laughs> I always try to avoid uh, political <laughs> controversy. <laughs> uh, absolutely, yeah. So, well, um, there are uh, actually relevant things that could be said which regard the uh, persistence of Berlusconi in power and why, yeah. why it is still there, actually. We're not all so dumb. Uh, that we keep <laughs> electing him, be, 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 uh, um, disregarding uh, the facts. Uh, yes? So something that you mentioned but you haven't stressed is the, the fact of familiarity and tradition is bias, right? So familiarity is really what breeds this comfort with a complex representation, even though there's a total lack of understanding of like the, the understanding behind it. Yes. And that's mm -hmm. a problem. And that can be linked to the Tea Party, so the more familiar a problem becomes because it's it's focused on in the media and it's packaged in very uh, easy to, to digest uh, packages, people become very familiar and as a result they believe they know about it, they don't. It happens in medicine, it happens in politics, it happens in economics. Uh, but uh, what makes it familiar is not only um, the way it is delivered using mediatic power, what makes it there must be something in the actual environment that you can connect it to. Uh, so it must. Exposure. I mean, even psychology should be priming. The more you prime somebody on a subject, the more they report knowledge of the subject, even if they don't have any. It's just mm. familiarity breeds a sense of knowledge, but yes, it but I, I, although I, I have issues with these experiments because yes. Yeah. If they are the same, always the same, you will never be afraid of and, and you have, and you have, yes, and you have uh, news hours on TV saying that there is inflation, there is inflation, there is inflation, but when you go to the gro grocery store, you don't see so much difference in your, in your, in your cash flow. It, it will not, I, my, my conjecture is, and my p prediction is, you will not develop this, uh, uh, um, a fear of inflation. You will not believe the news. No, so, and this is the, yeah, that is a conjecture. That has to be that's, that has to be uh, that has to be tested, actually. Yes. So that's the whole idea of marketing, like having the same ad run uh, a lot, even if you don't actually find these qualities in the product once you buy it, it's still stuck in your head. It's a meme. Um, yeah, but it doesn't work alone. It doesn't work alone. You can, you can market. You can market. Um, you can market a product in the best possible way and with all the means. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Think of uh, Hollywood uh, flops. Um, actor Kevin Costner um, uh, produced and, and directed a film called Underworld at the peak of his fame and using uh, a, sub a, a substantial budget and great the best marketing firms to market it. 
Has anyone seen that film? <laughs> um, can I just? Mm, I'm, I, I've reached the conclusion, so then we will we can talk as as as, as much as you want. Um, well, your inflation discourse that was interesting, but I mapped it immediately to uh, uh, global warming. Uh huh. And in, and I heard somebody say the other day, well, you know, they renamed it now climate change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Um, yeah, and that is something that also that is not surviving. That is not surviving the facts, and they have been exposed to. Uh, uh, you remember? You probably remember the scandal from last year. Um, so lay comprehension. Okay, let's call it lay comprehension. The way we understand complex representations is a way that we can call lay comprehension. It differs from a merely limited comprehension in that the former conceals the limits of one's own understanding. That is, lay comprehension conceals the limits of our own understanding. Lay comprehension is an unconsciously partial comprehension of a conceptual representation. Lay comprehension occurs as a result of a special combination of historical and epistemic factors that makes a complex representation significant to a population. But then again, um, historical and epistemic. Uh, the issues I have to mm, uh, get back to uh, uh, Cecilia's question with uh, experiments in laboratory is precisely that when you are in, an, in, an, in a laboratory setting, uh, all you have, the world for you, is what you are presented with. But in real life, you have communication and you have experience. You have what reaches, what comes to your head, and you have what your head, your eyes, and your ears see and listen to, without much, uh, uh, um, without much influence. Human, I mean, from other humans. You I see, it's there's. Understand what you think about familiarity as a driving force for this phenomenon, because you had mentioned initially that money is the most familiar thing mm -hmm. that you know. Mm -hmm. Really, they have no knowledge of the conceptual basis of it. Yeah. And I, I'm interested in understanding if, if, if you can. That notion, I think is very important. Right. You so, can your question is if uh, you can artificially create familiarity with something? No. I, 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 I want to understand whether you think it's a driving force or whether you just thought that in that particular example of money, familiarity oh, no, no, no. was important, but if it actually plays a, a significant role. No, it, it is definitely a, a driving force. It is definitely part of the driving force, yes. Uh, the, the fact that it is, it is familiar makes it easily understandable, gives you confidence in understanding. Everybody is talking about it, so why not me? We don't really know why that is. But we don't really know what that is, exactly. This is what comes... Um, and this is a, a for a further delving into this concept of lay comprehension, how it, uh, it, uh, it may... Uh, arise, but again, it's uh, um, it's conjectural at this point. Mm. This is the beginning of the project. Yes. I have a question. Sorry, this is the very beginning, but so it's okay. doesn't sound absurd. But do you think you could? Would you be happy with reducing or to uh, describing the cognitive relationship to money in terms of how, how people feel about modernity? I have to. I preface this with the fact that I'm taking care of my. 87-year-old um, grandfather, and it's not quite like living with somebody from the Tea Party, but he's born with these gold bugs. Mm -hmm. And so all of these factors that you're describing about, you know, not knowing what you know, but things mm -hmm. make sense, and mm -hmm. it really seems like the desire to have this, you know, use value mm -hmm. to money has to do with how you feel about freedom, how you feel about things being uncertain, and you want to tie things back to a fixed notion because things just seem too uncertain. And maybe you could say the same thing, you know, before World War I. The gold standard broke down, international institutions broke down, nations went inward towards fascism because modernity had failed. Uh, well, this is a very specific case that then is being linked to a very general notion like uh, modernity. I would rather say that in the case of uh, 
I, I, I also uh, had similar experiences. Uh, I remember my, my grandmother, um, a, a person who has a certain attitude with money, spe especially a, certain of a, cert a person of a certain age, I would rather link that to the, 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 the notion that he has uh, of money and the use that he has made of money in times when mm, credit cards didn't exist and, and, and money was conceived of in a, in a different way, but it's more of a personal, um, it's more of a personal issue in that case, I would say. Um, although, um, uh, reflecting upon uh, the description that you, that you gave of your uh, grandfather's attitude, I would say that even in this case, he's, uh, you know, you, he's relating his episteme, his knowledge, the knowledge that he has about, about uh, uh, the issue uh, with um, the world that he knows which, being a man of a certain age, is probably a world that doesn't include computers, is probably a world that includes only certain TV channels, uh, it's probably a world that includes a pretty restricted neighborhood. Uh, you know, so he's behaving consistently, I would say, and, and, and there is world in it, there is environment in it. Wait, yeah? this cognitive bias, like why people develop it. It's almost a defense mechanism because it's such a stressful uh, process. It's so anxiogenic to think about where the world is going, what you know, the stresses are in like, daily existence, that people are forced to sort of take these shortcuts, these hur heuristics, adopt these biases to comfort themselves. I, I mean, I think that that's an important uh, thing. Yeah. Mm. Although, uh, I repeat, other people would say that people use these biases simply because our brain evolved uh, in, an, uh, in an environment that was very different from the one we're living in, and uh, the brain is still geared to respond to the impulses of that environment instead of our environment. Mm -hmm. But this is just as conjectural at this point. as. Doesn't our environment, Excuse me, excuse me, there was, yes, excuse me. by exposure, but by the fact that we have certain evolved intuitions that easily and naturally apply to things to things that seem like resources, like money, mm -hmm. which may also be the source of why we feel uh, that it's evil, because our intuitions about fairness and, and unfairness about distribution apply, and they don't necessarily accord with the, the money as a representation of, of value that is generated. So but money, money cannot have undergone um, evo an evolutionary not, process because money, money necessarily must have existed. Yeah, right. it well, well, It could be equated with you know other things that we think of as resources. Right. Like well, money there is. Uh, there is a paper on uh, folk economics that addresses exactly this question. Um, it doesn't talk about money, though, but it talks of uh, trade, for example. Um, and it says that trade is uh, generally viewed as, um, uh, regarded as a zero-sum game and as um, uh, an example of commutative justice. That is, um, trade is perceived as something uh, where if I gain, you lose, and to be fair, we have to exchange products that have equal values. Mm -hmm. However, this is not the way we actually behave, and not because we are unfair, but we, there seems to be a mismatch between what we think we're doing when we behave economically and what we actually do when we behave economically. Otherwise, the world would not be the way we know it. And the reason why the world is the way we know it is that because trade is actually a positive sum game. Because you're not trading the goods, you're trading the values that are in them, and blah, blah, blah. So, so there seem to be, this is also uh, actually a, a research path that, uh, that has opened after this, uh, after this, uh, this research, understanding if and why uh, the way, the what, what we think about our economic action differs from what actu uh, our economic action actually is. And this is what makes, mm, this is what makes, uh, I, I, I mean, I don't know if there are some psychological grounds for this, but uh, this is what makes uh, for economics as a, as a profession. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we would all be economists, right? <laughs> well, 
<laughs> given, given the nature of complex representation, as you lay it out, on the one hand, and given the sort of uh, existential necessity of using money continuously, mm -hmm. day in and day out, in order to stay alive and to accomplish anything, how could you operate except by sort of closing your eyes and making believe that you know what you're doing? Because money, as you, on your account, is so complex that it's very hard to understand. True. Um, in fact, and this goes back to what uh, um, the lady asked uh, earlier, um, I'm not saying that this should not happen. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not attacking lay people. I am a lay person <laughs> myself. I think we're in a, in a world where division of uh, labor and division of intellectual labor is so, has reached such a detail, it is unavoidable. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this, yes, has to do with modernity. Modernity has brought this. Um, my, my idea is that we have to live with this, but maybe we can be a little more aware. It's, it, it connects, to, it, it, it relates to critical thinking, which is uh, very often a marginal discipline in, uh, in, in, in universities, <laughs> but maybe there should be uh, something, uh, some, some more work to do on it. I mean, be a, being aware that um, He's talking about Italian. <laughs> I'm talking about Italian <laughs> universities, of course. Yeah. It's only because public opinion is so important, it's such an important factor in what actually gets done about the situation. Yeah. Um, you can actually dig a bigger hole for yourself. Mm. If, if you think I you know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, well, to a certain extent, you have to rely on, other, on others anyway. Uh, but I think, you know, we, mm, we're, talking, we're talking about um, um, uh, um, solution, f looking for a solution to the problem, uh, assuming it is a problem, actually. I don't even see it as a problem. Yes, it has problematic implications, but it's, it's not a problem. It's just the way we are. It's, it's just the way we are condemned. We are, we are <laughs> destined, <laughs> destined to be, uh, given, given, given the division of intellectual labor, what we might do is maybe maybe try uh, through education to make the, f the 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 fourth attitude the attitude of I don't know that I don't know um, less and less common and replace it with uh, the others at the other attitudes such as uh, I know that I don't know and I I try to find a reliable source for my <laughs> but that uh, that would uh, that could m could be a good idea. <laughs> Yes, but then again, but then again, that's that may not be that may not be the solution. That may not be the solution, because there are a lot of issues with that too. Uh, sure. Even in in economics itself, I mean, you read uh, experts writing on on the New York Times. They say they say A, and you read the experts writing on the Wall Street Journal. They say non A. Uh, how do you how do you decide? Yeah, ideology. You, you don't want to end talking about politics, but it's inevitable to keep thinking about it. Because mm -hmm. the kinds of, for example, the kinds of reactions to uh, social programs mm -hmm. that, the, let's say, let's just mention the Tea Party people mm -hmm. have. Uh, when you look at this, the size of the documents that we are being asked to uh, support and the hair raising complexity of them, it's understandable. Mm -hmm. It's understandable that people would be terrified by it. Uh, and peop people support these movements also for um, uh, very different reasons, um, because may perhaps they may be more sensitive to one part of the, uh, um, of the whole ideology that is behind, but not to the other. Then they accept, you know, I take, I don't know, I take uh, um, the... the, the um, uh, religious fundamentalism, because in fact, what I want is lower taxes. You know, that there are different uh, different ways to adhere to a to a to a political program. Yeah, uh, I, I was just wondering whether perhaps e economics or money might not necessarily be the best case to go because of the A not A and some discussion in some quarters about the science of economics mm -hmm. to start with. What I was thinking of is a student of mine uh, did her senior thesis on scientific illiteracy. Mm -hmm. And the issue that she used was stem cell research. Mm -hmm. And 
she, what she discovered was that virtually everything that was said, and, and, and almost in everything were her words, about stem cell research was actually scientifically wrong. And mm. that the things that people thought they knew and believed and were certain about, and, and, and Tina was adamant, you know, and had a whole slideshow on this, mm -hmm. that almost everything lay people thought about stem cell research was wrong. Not in the A or not A, but actually scientifically mm -hmm. not the case. And yet people were absolutely certain about it. Uh, as it happens, uh, stem cell was one of the words that I had chosen as a complex representation, as, a, as an example of complex representations. I, I decided, I decided to delete it because I don't, because I feared questions about it because I don't master the subject uh, uh, very well. Uh, but yes, I had the impression that stem cell might be one of yeah. Determine the yes or no Absolutely. Although, although there is uh, always uh, some approximation to the truth also in uh, hard sciences, uh, mm, it's certainly less controversial than, than economics. As I told you, this, this, this is not a theory I, in, I, I invented as such. It's something that came out of a, of a, of a case study of a research uh, from, from, from the bottom up. And I, I was dealing with uh, literary texts uh, m which had uh, money uh, uh, among their topics. And I start asking myself why it is so, what is happening, what is going on here, and this is how I, how I came up. But, but yes, the theory is absolutely applicable to um, uh, uh, scientific, to folk science, as they call it. Uh, stem cell may be a case in point. It's a good idea for further. I mean, I'm, I'm ready to bet that stem cell is just as money a complex representation. Mm -hmm. That is something that we feel we, we know about it because we read on newspapers, because we see important people talking about it, like the Pope, for example, <laughs> always yeah. to talk about Italy. Um, uh, but, uh, but then, in fact, you know, who, who, who really knows what is a stem cell? I mean, who, who can really go, b I mean, unless you are a biologist, yeah. who would go beyond a Wikipedia article? Yes. The thing about stem cells, though, is that unlike money, uh, our beliefs and what we think we know about stem cells is largely an issue of our allegiance to various uh, political groups. Right. It's not like we have to use our knowledge about stem cells on a daily basis. It's mm -hmm. about vote. Mm -hmm. And we, all, at least in the United States, vote along party lines generally anyway, or at least along you know, lines of political formation. So, right, so yeah. it's, it's a slightly different case than money because know, there's, there's no cause for us to, to use any knowledge on that, of it on a daily basis. Also, evolution is probably exactly. in public policy quite exactly. a bit. It's very yeah. In this country. But, yes? But the way that it does impact a, a sort of uh, daily news in the sense is that uh, pub politicians tend to side with uh, the majority uh, public opinion, and it hinders research for no reason, because people uh, have a misunderstanding of the idea. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, of course there is um, political action that uh, uh, uses these... Um, so in a sense it is part of... Uses lay comprehension. I mean, I, I think, yes, I think you can use lay comprehension in order to... Um, I, I put homosexuality uh, among the um, complex representations. Um, in, in Italian political debate three years ago, uh, a center-left government tried to um, pass an act, a law that would legalize, um, uh, how would you say, copy civil, unions. Uh, civil unions, mm -hmm. civil unions. And if you, uh, uh, if you, if you read uh, the political declara declarations of the time, you would see that they would uh, definitely play on the lay comprehension of what homosexuality is in order to get their argument across. So it is something that you can uh, somehow manipulate. So then one definition of a complex representation would, and I'm asking, would include the notion of number four, that some aspect of a complex representation is that people think they Oh, yes, yes, know absolutely. There is a, yes, 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 yes. So that yes, would yes, be yes. another definition of a Yes, 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 absolutely. It is, it is a representation that hides its complexity. I mean, that hides those aspects 
uh, that are not readily available. That is why I call it complex. I couldn't find a better word, maybe there is, but. There's another sense in which you could describe complex representation is what I think uh, has been called, uh, Pocconi and others call emergent blending. Mm -hmm. So it's an emergent blend which then is available to be used without regard for the specific, all the elements that went into it. Mm. But it's used by the ideologue or by whoever. Yes. So this I think theoretically you could describe it as emergent blending. This, this may be, although I'm not familiar with Fouconnier's uh, uh, concept, but yes, this may be the, the way you are describing it. The way you describe it can, can, fit, can fit that, uh, that description, yeah, can fit the idea. More uh, questions? I think um, Stefano might be around for a few more minutes for like very interested people. And uh, uh, I thank you all anyway for coming and uh, actually for filling the room. Yeah. Very. <laughs> 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 and uh, thanks again, yeah. Stefan, for coming in the dead of winter. Thanks to you. <laughs> thanks to you and you all. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's not usually like this in January in New York. <laughs>